people in this room and the people watching online working from home, it's Friday. Many of you will be aware of the significant advances over the last 20 years or so in what we might call micro to macro studies of productivity and economic activity. And these studies typically use information on businesses and their employees collected for the purpose of creating aggregate statistics, but they use them to create completely new metrics on the dynamics of growth and other structural indicators of the economy. This type of work is quite challenging. It's time consuming, encounters numerous data access issues and requires regular investment in upkeep that isn't always forthcoming. Uh, but it's very worthwhile and has led to many new insights about growth, the labor market and businesses. I think at the center of this activity is probably a handful of people who have led the way, one of whom is Professor Javier Miranda uh, with us today. So it's an absolute pleasure to have him here to speak with us. Javier Miranda is an academic, a doctor and a professor, deputy head of department, structural change and productivity at the Halle Institute for Economic Research in Germany, as well as, as professor in microeconomics and productivity research at Friedrich Schiller University, Jena. He has published in high ranking journals, such as the American Economic Review. And at the same time, he has also spent many years at the Census Bureau in the United States, where he has achieved great things. So please welcome Professor Miranda. Thank you, Rebecca. You are so kind, so generous. I am delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be here at King's College with Rebecca and with ESCO. Um, indeed, I, uh, uh, before I moved back to, um, uh, to Europe, I worked at the Census Bureau for almost 20 years um, as a student first uh, and then as an employee. Uh, so uh, today I'm in my, uh, I'm in my element by this uh, uh, conference about uh, uh, measurement. I see a lot of colleagues from different statistical agencies. Shout out to my buddy, Kathy Buffington from the Census Bureau, uh, conspirator in innovation uh, and innovating activities at the Census. Um, so I'm delighted to be here. Um, and Rebecca is exactly right. Uh, innovation is not always uh, easy, um, but actually let me get my slides back. And then I will start. There we go. So um, <clears throat> innovation uh, at a statistical agency is not always easy. And, um, and of course, this is a big important part of my life. So I felt that today I wanted to split my talk between kind of my experiences at the US Census Bureau uh, and our attempts there at innovating. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that we've learned uh, from uh, building these databases and some of the work that I'm doing now in Europe, uh, extending some of that work with similar databases uh, here. So uh, innovation in a, in a statistical agency often feels like this Dilbert cartoon, right? Uh, that's almost by design, right? Uh, some is by design, some is, you know, lots of different constraints. Um, you know, statistical agencies uh, uh, are risk averse by nature, right? And innovation is almost the opposite, right? You're breaking, right? You're breaking things, trying to develop new things. That is risky. Um, of course, there's uh, uh, not a lot of resources, right? They're we're typically underfunded. Uh, budgets uh, and budget lines are assigned. So, as an innovator at the Census Bureau, I often had to go find uh, money outside of the census to do the things that I wanted to do, right? So there are challenges, uh, but the important thing is over the last 20 years, things have changed quite dramatically, right? We all now recognize the importance of uh, innovation in statistical agencies, all of the things that Rebecca mentioned. We're here today at King's College as a UNESCO conference uh, uh, supported by the ONS. So obviously we all recognize uh, the importance of, of innovation. And so I wanna talk a little bit about how I see uh, uh, I, our work, uh, uh, the work that I did at the Census Bureau, some of the challenges and some of the ways that we um, try to overcome it. Um, 
And then I'll talk again about some of the th things that we've learned and I'll go to a, to a particular example. So uh, I guess I'll say to our, uh, and my statistical colleagues, uh, statistical agencies, it's okay to feel a little bit like Dilbert. Um, we can still do lots of uh, good, good things uh, in there. Okay. Um, I'll say one more thing, by the way, Kathy uh, Buffington, uh, uh, my fellow innovator at the Census Bureau was critical, right, in bringing out some, some of these innovations because she was able to, to navigate uh, through, through the constraints. And of course, that's also critical, right? So again, a shout out to Kathy. Um, all right, so, um, so statistical offices obviously collect a wealth of information. They've been doing this for a long time. Um, uh, initially, right, a lot of it through surveys, and uh, but but this is expensive, right? It's it's uh, it's costly, and it's only those costs are only increasing. Um, and and there's a little bit of a trade-off, right? Uh, traditionally, statistical agencies have been tasked with describing what's happening today, right? Just paint a picture of what we're producing, how, where. Um, and then let's move on, right? Uh, often driven by national accounts, right? And the importance of national account statistics. Um, and there's a, a little bit of a trade-off, right? Because ideally, uh, and by the way, I'm gonna talk about business uh, data at the Census Bureau or at statistical offices, right? But the range of activities at statistical offices are very wide. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I know, which is the, the, the business data. And within that, about I'm going to talk a little bit more about administrative data, right? Um, so some of the work that I did with Kathy was about robots and uh, and AI, and uh, and so a little bit different from what I'm going to be talking about today. So uh, so there's of course ideally we would like to survey every single firm every year, right? And that's our best picture that we could ever hope to get about what's happening and how things are are changing. That's really expensive. Of course, we cannot do it. At, and so, of course, uh, as good statisticians uh, and economists, we do, uh, you know, we do surveys. And if we want to get us an accurate a picture of what's happening in the economy, we're going to be targeting large firms, right? That's where most of the activity is. And, um, and there's fewer of them, right? Activity is highly skewed. And so that's what we're going to be targeting. We're going to be targeting uh, large firms, and then we're going to get samples uh, of smaller firms uh, to get a sense for what's going on there. Um, and that serves the purposes, uh, the traditional purposes, I'm going to say, of a statistical agency very, very well, and, and we do it really well. Um, now, things have changed a little bit um, in the sense that there's, you know, policymakers and, and analysts and, and researchers and, and development agencies uh, increasingly want more sophisticated data, right? They want data about our changing world and how the economy is changing. And, uh, and if we want to do that and be responsive to that, um, all this focus on large firms is not necessarily the ideal, right? Large firms are not where the most dynamic parts of the economy are. Uh, of course, if you have a large firm failing, that's a, that's a huge problem and they're going to have a big impact. But typically, large firms are not as dynamic. It's typically not where the action is, right? And so um, this is where the work that I've been doing, and I've been lucky to do it with, uh, with people like, like John Holtiwanger and Ron Jarmin and other people at the, uh, uh, around, the, uh, around Washington, D.C. So if we want to pay attention to these more dynamic parts, uh, then we need uh, additional data. Uh, you know, policymakers also want to see uh, one additional granularity, right? They want to know what's happening in this location, in these geographies, with this, with these industries, right? So it's not just the national uh, picture anymore. We need additional, uh, an additional uh, granularity. And uh, and ideally, by the way, we want to know what's happening today, not two years ago, right? So st statistical agency data is typically quite, quite, quite old. Uh, it, why? Because it takes time to process, right? There's lots of attention to detail. We want to get it right. And so naturally, it's going to take a little bit of time. So these new challenges, not so new anymore, um, uh, uh, you know, they're very difficult to address with survey data. And this is where administrative data comes, uh, comes in. And when I say administrative data, 
it's not necessarily purely administrative data. It is often enhanced with survey data. Uh, and so some of these data sets, are like the business register at the, uh, uh, in the US, at the core uh, are administrative in, in nature, but, they're, but then we en enhance them uh, uh, to serve the purposes of the, of the statistical agency, right? So uh, yes, administrative data, but they're all often enhanced and they're quite complex, very complex data products. So what are some of the uh, um, administrative de data records that are available in statistical agencies or agencies around, around town? Obviously tax records, right? Income and payroll uh, uh, tax records. Social security records, uh, worker level uh, uh, and jobs uh, records. You might have balance sheet data. Uh, in Europe, we have uh, a wealth of balance sheet data as well with assets, liabilities, ownership equity. There's commercial business registers uh, as well. But then there's a whole bunch of administrative data that we can link to the score, uh, um, a, a core base uh, registers. And so this is where the, the custom tree transactions data comes in, inter intellectual property registers come in, there's education and licensing records, there's all kinds of subsidy and grants information. And uh, if you partner with financial institutions, you could also get financial uh, loan uh, data. So very, very rich data. Uh, and at the Census Bureau, we have this goal of trying to link it all together. So now you have firms, you have workers, and you have all of the, uh, as many of the, of the real activities of, of firms as, as possible, and including possibly financial information um, for, uh, uh, for, for the near universe uh, of, of firms, if not the universe. So what's nice about these, these types of data, um, they're collected as part of an administrative uh, process. Um, they are uh, annual or quarterly, so they're collected at, uh, at different frequency. Some of it is daily. Um, so some of these data are extremely timely. Uh, and so for some applications uh, uh, that need uh, really timely data, it's, it's, it's very useful. I've mentioned this universal or near universal, which means that you can do uh, really dig into, uh, into the granularity of the data by geography and by industry. Right? So this is something that's hard to do uh, with survey data uh, e every year. Um, importantly, because it's uh, universal or near universal, you can track dynamics uh, of small businesses and uh, startups in particular uh, really well and uh, focus on the uh, skewed nature uh, of those dynamics, which is almost impossible to do with survey data. Importantly, these uh, administrative bases have known properties, right? They are uh, representative uh, of, of the population. There's no additional cost to collecting this data. These data are collected at some uh, part of some administrative process. But uh, Rebecca said it exactly right. Uh, it's not easy to work with this data. Uh, I mentioned that you often have to enhance it to make sense of them. You have to work with it uh, sometimes for years, right? To make sense of uh, and make sure that you understand uh, how the data is working. The data are of course highly confidential, right? So you have to work with this data within secure environments. And um, I mentioned it, uh, is, uh, already, they're not necessarily designed for uh, economic analysis, right? They're the byproduct of some administrative purpose. So that requires a lot of extra work to get them to tell you uh, a story, kind of what you need to, what you need to, what you need to know. But uh, of course, national statistical offices have a uh, comparative advantage uh, in this, right? They have statistical expertise. Um, they have surveys um, that they know uh, and have a good sense of what's happening in the economy. And uh, they know how to work well within strict confidentiality parameters, right? It's the bread and butter of statistical offices. So, um, so there's a comparative advantage that, that statistical offices have. That there's important challenges that I already mentioned, right? Um, 
funding, uh, developing the expertise, uh, retaining that expertise, um, and then accessing these databases, right? Some of these databases are not naturally at the statistical office, you have to go and get it, right? So I spent years going around town getting databases from, uh, in, the, in the case of the, the US, the tax agency, right? Because we wanted to expand the types of things that we could do, right? So you have to get kind of quite entrepreneurial uh, to get, um, uh, you know, to get uh, things uh, in and, uh, and to expand the range of things that you, that you can do um, as a statistical agency. I'm going to say, uh, a statistical agency, I'll say it again, recognize uh, all these challenges. There's, uh, there, uh, there, there's a strong drive to innovate and a strong recognition that it's also important to expand the type of statistics that we provide as ag agencies to our policymakers, uh, to industry. If not, by the way, somebody else will do it. Certainly at the Census Bureau, we were <laughs> extremely aware that big data is out there, and people want information, they will use whatever information they, ha they can get their hands on, right? It doesn't matter what the quality of that information is, they will use it. And so, um, as statistical agencies, certainly at the Census Bureau, we had this idea that if we didn't innovate and push forward, we will, we're gonna be uh, pushed out of business <laughs> by, uh, by, uh, by, by the private sector, uh, pushing these other products that, who, which properties, uh, the properties of which, we don't fully understand, right, by the way. So these are often un unstructured databases. Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna say I've been very lucky uh, uh, in my career, <coughs> working with amazing colleagues and academics uh, inside the statistical office at the US Census Bureau. Um, uh, what I think worked really well at the Census Bureau is that we had this dedicated staff, research staff within this uh, research and methods uh, division, right? And we were a whole bunch, an hour, uh, the folks that are still there, um, you know, a whole bunch of uh, PhD economists doing research with this data and pushing things forward, right? Uh, and interacting with academics, uh, very much aware of the policy questions, uh, but, but why is it particularly important to have this, uh, I, I felt to have this, uh, this type of people in the, in the statistical office, and I certainly felt I was one of those people. Um, you know better than anybody <laughs> what data you have. People outside the statistical office don't know what you have, is the reality, right? There are tremendous amounts of information in a statistical agency or that you're aware of that you can go get, right? Um, People inside the statistical office know this, they know the data, and they know uh, potentially what kind of things and what kind of questions you can address uh, with those data. Um, and so that model worked very well with the US, I know it works well with Netherlands, um, right? Uh, so the ability to hire uh, people that can develop deep knowledge uh, of the data uh, and, uh, and make the investments uh, in those data is very, very important in my, in my view. What were our goals? Uh, to use this data to, to publish, right? I thought of ourselves very much as a very large uh, micro department, a uh, uh, whole bunch of PhDs doing micro uh, empirical work, um, right? So in that sense, I've, uh, I've been very, very, uh, very, very lucky in my career. Collaboration with external academics, critical, right? So uh, the RDC system, and of course the ONS system is a model, right? It works really well. Uh, it's really important, right? You bring academics from the outside, uh, you interact with them, and so there's uh, mingling of ideas, right? Uh, and synergies from that. Um, both through the RDC, but also through specific collaborations, right? So ESCO is a wonderful uh, uh, example of that. Um, also uh, at the statistical office in the Netherlands, uh, other places, I don't know all of the uh, statistical offices in, 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 uh, in, in Europe, so I won't mention you all. Okay, but importantly, if you get it right, you can innovate uh, very, very successfully, 
right? Uh, it doesn't mean that it's easy, right? And I'll show you some of the, the products later on that, um, that we've developed uh, over the years at the Census Bureau, and it takes, right, it takes years for each of these products, right? It takes a huge amount of effort. All right, so, um, <clears throat> so let me uh, now take a little bit of time to tell you some of the things that we've, uh, that we've learned through uh, the use and the, the exploration of these databases, right? And so, uh, so what are some of the things that we know? Well, modern market economies are incredibly dynamic, right? In any given year, 30% of uh, the jobs, these are numbers for the US, but they're similar across, uh, across Europe. Uh, in any given year, 30% of jobs are either created or destroyed. This is huge. <laughs> uh, and these are jobs that are being created or destroyed. It's uh, uh, job reallocation from firms that are exiting or contracting towards businesses that are more productive, more valuable, that are expanding. Uh, and so huge amounts of dynamism uh, underlying the aggregate statistics, right? There's, huge amounts of, of churn. Um, of course, we now know that uh, startup activity and young firms are critical for this process. Right? So we know young firms uh, disproportionately contribute to job creation and to productivity growth. And so you, ha you can see this here. Um, but it's not as simple as that, right? Uh, uh, these startups, these young firms, are incredibly volatile. Uh, many of them go away very quickly within the first five years, right? Most of the success, uh, uh, remaining ones will remain small, right? Most, small business, most businesses are small, right? These were startups at some point. And, but uh, relatively few of them grow tremendously, right? And grow to become uh, the large firms uh, uh, that we know today. So the large firms of today were startups at some point. It's another way of saying uh, the same thing. Right? So, so um, growth dynamics are, are highly skewed. Right? Most firms, most startups remain small if they don't exit, but a few uh, grow a lot. It's a dynamic version of something that we already know, right? activities, uh, uh, employment, uh, uh, and production is highly skewed. Most of the workers, um, uh, most of the jobs are at large firms. Most, uh, 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 most of production is at, at large firms. Right? So this is the dynamic version of this. Right? And so if you care about, again, if you care about understanding how things are changing in the economy, you want to pay a lot of attention to what's happening here. At least that was our, our, our prior. So, um, so what do we also n n now uh, understand a little bit better? These high growth firms um, contribute a lot of jobs and, and uh, revenue and, uh, and output growth to the economy. And so if you look at employment, uh, the 15% of firms that can be classified as high growth firms, and here we're gonna say a, a firm is high growth if it grows more than 25% in a given year. So the 12th or 15% of firms that are high growth uh, contribute almost 60% of all the, uh, the gro gross job creation uh, in the economy. Right? So high growth firms contribute a huge amount of uh, jobs uh, and job creation, gross job creation to the economy. In terms of revenue or output, uh, revenue output, uh, about 12% contribute 50% uh, of, of uh, revenue growth. So huge contribution uh, from this very dynamic, uh, relatively small uh, young firms. By the way, there's high growth firms everywhere, but young firms are more likely uh, to be uh, high growth. Feel free to stop me at any time, ask any questions. We don't have to wait until the end. I'm happy with, uh, with questions as, uh, as, we, as we go. OK. So some other things that we uh, now know that we didn't know uh, before. Um, things are slowing down. 
uh, in quite dramatic ways uh, in the US and now we know also, and we've known for a little bit of time now, also in, in Europe, and I'll show you some, some stuff. Uh, so, so a very, uh, a, a, I'm gonna say a secular trend decline in dynamism uh, in the US. How are we gonna define dynamism? By the reallocation of jobs across the economy, across firms, right, and businesses. So here we have a measure of job reallocation. It's the sum of job create, jobs created uh, and jobs destroyed across the economy, right? Jobs moving from firm to firm, right? Firms expanding, firms contracting, uh, firms entering, firms e exiting. So uh, that job reallocation, that churning, if you will, has been uh, going down quite a bit, almost 30 uh, percent over the last 30 years. This, this particular graph ends a little bit early, but it's uh, still it's flattened out a little bit, but it still uh, hasn't really picked up. Um, some of that uh, we know, some of this decline, is in part due to a decline in startup activity. So there's less um, uh, firms, fewer firms uh, 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 as, a, as a share of the population of firms or the population as a whole being created every year, right? So stop, startup rates are going down, going down significantly as well. Um, now, this is not explained uh, only by the decline in startup activity, of course, if there's a declining startup activity, there's gonna be, you know, these firms are very dynamic. I already told you a lot of them are exiting, a lot of them are growing, a lot of them are, are declining. So this decline can only be explained by, a, by uh, partly by a declining startup activity. Maybe 25% of that decline can be explained by uh, the fact that the economy, firms in the economy are, are getting older on average, right? There's fewer startups, That's another way of saying the same thing. small startups, internet firms that are uh, backed by friends and family, those aren't going to show up if you're in, in this. Yeah. They don't have revenues. Right? That's right. So they do have revenues. Are we, are they, so the reason... Okay. Could you repeat the question? Because yeah. Because For sure. Uh, um, so Leonard Nakamura was asked from the Federal Reserve in Sa San Francisco, right? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Uh, is asking whether we're missing uh, some of the action here in this data because we don't have um, small businesses without employees or without revenue that are supported by, um, by family and friends. Uh, and so here we're talking about, so you're right, here we're talking about businesses with employees, right? So we're, we're not looking at kind of the gig economy, what some might call the gig economy, uh, sole proprietors without employees, that's not part of this, this, uh, this picture. And you're right that if you look at that part of the economy, uh, it, it, there's, there's quite a bit of growth, right? So the gig economy, like businesses without employees, it's growing uh, quite, uh, quite dramatically. We don't quite understand that part uh, of the economy. This is a, like you say, it's a lot of hobby businesses. We don't you know, really know what that is. M most of those never go to create uh, a single job. Uh, most of those businesses disappear. If, if, if young firm activity in, in, in for, for businesses with employees is, is highly volatile, it's even more volatile for businesses without employees, the type of businesses. So most of them actually disappear within two years. So uh, we're gonna be focusing here on the part of the business activity that generates revenue, that generates um, jobs. Uh, and so we're gonna be silent uh, about that. That's a whole world. There's a lot of interest in, in understanding that part. And databases are being developed for that. It's even harder to work with those databases. That's why that work is lagging a little bit behind. But lots of good questions in that, in that, uh, in that sphere. Sorry, really sorry, good question in three. Yeah. Can you just tell us what the, like a, a number like 35? Yeah. So thank you, Jonathan. So the question is, what does a number like 35 mean? So what this means is that 35% uh, of jobs, or 35 out of 100 jobs, are either created or destroyed. 
Um, so these are rates. So 35% of the jobs in a single year are either created or destroyed in that year. Um, so very sharp decline in terms of this, right? This is a very high level summary metric of the level of dynamism or the amount or the intensity of dynamism that's taking place in the, uh, in the economy. Okay. So, um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm starting to reach now to the, to the, to the, to the research uh, questions. And so some of the work that, uh, that I did with, uh, with, uh, uh, with John and Ryan and, and Ron at the US Census Bureau was then asked the question, okay, well, dynamism is in decline in the US economy. Uh, and it could be that the reason is that uh, the economy uh, broadly is, uh, is, is not as, is not as uh, uh, businesses are not experiencing uh, as many shocks uh, or as intense shocks uh, as they did, right? Maybe we live now increasingly in a more tranquil business environment, right? Uh, businesses are not experiencing uh, 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 productivity shocks, right? Innovation shocks or demand shocks as much as they did. And if that's the case, right? Maybe they don't need to be as responsive. They don't need to be creating as much job creation. Uh, they don't need to reallocate jobs as much, right? So if everything is, is easier, more tranquil, if the environment is slowing down, the business environment is slowing down, then we might expect, expect to see a decline in job reallocation. Of course, by the way, job reallocation is hard. Right? I think, Jonathan, you made this point to me a lot years ago when I was, we were starting to, to, to dig into this data. Job reallocation is hard. There's, hard, right? there's, a lot of, there's lots of losses from, from job reallocation. So it's not ideal necessarily to have. Right? There's losses associated with job reallocation. Um, and so, uh, so maybe this decline is not, is not all bad. Right? But uh, it, it turns out we do not live in an increasingly tranquil environment. If anything, things are getting more and more turbulent, right? So these are, um, this is the dispersion in TFP shocks or labor productivity on the right. And so uh, what you see is that uh, businesses are increasingly uh, experiencing either innovation shocks or demand shocks, and, but they're just not responding to them as they did. And so the question is why? Uh, and so there's a whole research ag agenda and lots of people are trying to figure out why is this? <laughs> why is this that you know, things are more turbulent but businesses are not as responsive? Uh, I, if anything, they're slowing down. Everything seems to be slowing down, uh, certainly in the US. Um, you know, I just wanted to show this chart um, uh, Kathy knows this, this data well. Uh, these are the um, uh, highly uh, timely um, business formation statistics, right? So we were able to track what's happening in the economy in real time through the COVID shock, right? Through this business formation. So I wanted to show you a couple of things. This is administrative data, right? Um, you could never hope to get this timely data uh, through, through surveys. Des describing the population, right, uh, the, the, uh, uh, of business uh, of business applications. So, I just wanted to uh, plug my bodies again uh, at the census. So, other things uh, that we have learned, uh, I've mentioned the decline in responsiveness to shocks. Uh, we understand a little bit better the decline in entrepreneurship. Uh, we know and understand the disproportionate. Uh, uh, contribution of young and uh, young firms, in particular, to innovation uh, uh, activities. We now understand the importance that uh, immigration and immigrants have in the U.S. for job creation as well as innovation. Uh, we understand a little bit better entrepreneurship gaps by demographics, uh, the role of inventors and entrepreneurs, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Right, and a, a lot of this is coming from. Uh, exploiting and uh, investing in administrative uh, data uh, and these new data products. 
So some uh, some of the some of the uh, uh, products that we've we've created. So the Longitudinal Business Database has been part of the Census Bureau for a long time now, uh, and is one of the most uh, demanded databases at the RDC. It's great to see. It was great to see Russell um, at the ONS uh, and ESCO. Uh, the the work that uh, that you presented here last year, or, or, or uh, folks in your team presented on the Longitudinal Business Database. Uh, that's phenomenal, right? That's a f an example of how you can use this data f uh, to target granular activity. Um, so just great. Um, so that's based on the payroll uh, register. We also have a worker level register, right, from unemployment insurance records. That's job register. So that is now also and has been for years research ready uh, at the Census Bureau. And like I mentioned, we've been trying to just link all kinds of data, right, to these core frames, right? So the, uh, uh, the trade transactions data, so I was involved uh, in that. Uh, uh, intellectual property uh, data, you can link to these records, right? Remember, you have the universe of firms and the universe of workers that are inside of these firms, right? So you can link all kinds of things now. Right, so intellectual property, you can link uh, demographics of workers, um, uh, 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 you have the business formation statistics, you can look at uh, dispersion statistics, all kinds of things. Um, uh, so I look at Michael for the, for the dispersion statistics and the work that the, the statistical office in the, in the Netherlands is doing as well. So this is an ongoing project, right, it's a big ongoing project and with each of these things right I, I so um, it, it takes years right I, it, each of these products takes years to develop right and so you need teams of people that are working uh, that are developing expertise um, and that are committed uh, to the activity right um, so still lots to do uh, but that's where I'm gonna stay um, the payoffs are huge. Rebecca mentioned it, right? So we've learned a lot and have uh, these types of research has uh, influenced uh, uh, the fields of micro, I.O., labor, entrepreneurship, uh, just huge payoffs. Okay, let's uh, quick switch uh, to talk about some pan-European efforts. Uh, so of course there's activities around this in all the statistical offices around Europe. Uh, we're not like the, right, uh, there's a lot of different countries here <laughs> and, uh, and ideally we would like to see uh, some, uh, some comparison of, of this uh, and some research, uh, some comparative research across countries. So there's efforts now to create harmonized databases across different countries um, and so that's what the microdata infrastructure is. It's a lot of work, right, because now you have to harmonize in such a way that you can, uh, if you're a member of this network, you can run and develop code in one node and then run it. If you're a member of this network, you can run it across uh, other statistical offices and get aggregated disclosed output uh, back. Right? So Eric Bartosman's been uh, working on this for years now, so I've been working with him now for, for a couple of years. The Comnet data is the, the micro-distributed uh, uh, version of that, where we uh, uh, send code to different statistical offices or central banks, and we get aggregated output, output back. And so I'm going to use some of this data uh, to tell you a little bit about what's happening uh, in, uh, in Europe. So this is uh, now work with Filippo Biondi at uh, Leuven, uh, Sergio in Ferrara here at Queen's Mary, and Matthias Mertens, he's a colleague at the, at the IWH. So I've already mentioned the decline in business dynamism, uh, potential implications uh, from pro you know, for productivity growth from some of my own work with John and, and Ryan, implications for innovation. Uh, Nick is not here, but some of his work speaks to this uh, as well. Uh, it has implications for recoveries, uh, the decline in dynamism has broad implications, not just for business activity, but also for workers, right? Um, so these are just a few of the, uh, of the, um, of the uh, pot potential implications for, for our economies. I mentioned there's a huge amount of work 
trying to figure out why this is. There's lots of uh, proposed explanations. I'm just going to mention a, a few. In our own work, we've talked broadly about frictions. Uh, uh, other people talk about declining uh, knowledge diffusion. The work of the OECD here is, is notable, as well as uh, UFUCs. Uh, the work, the, the role of market power and its interaction with uh, change in technology, right? That's the work of, uh, of the, uh, the Jans, Jan de Locker, Jan, Jan uh, Ekau, uh, and Mongai. Uh, there's other explanations, right? So uh, you can think about financial uh, uh, finance uh, stories. Uh, you can think about the role of non-intangibles uh, that might be playing in, in all of these. So, so, um, so Jonathan, thank you, for, of course, for all your insights on that and conversations. Um, so many of the potential explanations uh, for, for all of these. Most of this literature, I'm going to say, uses US data, right, with some exceptions. So there's some work done in, in Belgium. Uh, Ufuk's done some work with Turkey. I've mentioned the work of the OECD, amazing work. Um, so and these data sets are also documenting this decline uh, in business dynamism broadly uh, in Europe. Um, a lot of these databases are uh, 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 not accessible broadly to the public and to researchers. So what are we going to do here is we're going to create a new database that is uh, European-wide for 19 uh, economies. The, U the UK is now part of this database, uh, and it's currently been uh, developed. Uh, not quite ready yet, but it'll be ready quite soon. Um, and so we can use this data uh, to look at business dynamism. This data is accessible broadly. If you want to access it today, you can send out an email and you can get access to it. Right? So this is the beauty of this data. It's accessible to everybody. It's a huge investment, and we want to make sure that people can access it. So we're going to use this data to uh, describe what's happening in Europe. Uh, also look a little bit at the responsiveness uh, to shocks. And then we're going to look at, um, we're going to derive a, a framework in this paper where we're going to look at the role that technology and market power has or might have in explaining uh, the decline in dynamism. A few, uh, a few uh, uh, preliminary findings, declining business dynamism, uh, it's uh, almost in every country, if not in every country. Responsiveness uh, to shocks. You know, the responsiveness to the business em environment is going down, also in Europe, quite dramatically, in a very similar ways uh, to what's happening in the US. And uh, we think technology has a lot to do with it. Right? We're still working on this part uh, of the paper, so I won't show you, I, I won't have definitive, uh, definitive uh, results today. All right. Um, a little bit about the data. Um, so I'm going to, this, this COMNET data, this aggregated data that you can access today if you send out an email. Uh, <coughs> so we're collecting it through the COMNET uh, network. So what does the network do? They run these harmonized codes, or these protocols. They run it on administrative data, either at central banks or statistical offices. What we get back is disclosed uh, industry level uh, output. It's very, very rich information. In includes information on business dynamism, on markups, on productivity, firm growth, um, you know, by industry, by size, by age, right? It's very, very, very rich data. Um, then we're going to use, uh, so I'm going to show you some basic facts about what's happening in Europe using those data. And then I'm going to use German data where we actually can work with the micro data uh, to dig a little bit into uh, the, the mechanisms behind the decline in business dynamism for Germany in particular. So accessing this uh, data, we can control a little bit more uh, uh, how we work with it. And so that's what we can do a better job uh, at measuring uh, TFP. And so that's what we're going to do for that part of the paper. Um, this gives you a little bit of a sense, right? So we have data for many countries covering almost, this is for the eighth vintage. We now have data for 2020 for many, many of the economies. 
Uh, you can see that it's, these are very large samples, right? These are uh, often based on the administrative data. We have to do a little bit of reweighing, uh, re right, to return the populations. But these are samples that are anywhere between 60 to 90 percent of the population that we're working with. Okay, so let's get to these uh, patterns of business dynamism in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, in Europe. So we're going to be using these measures of job reallocation. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. Okay, so this is what we see, right? So pay no attention to the Netherlands, because I know there's something wrong with the way we're processing those data. So yesterday uh, we had um, uh, Michael present the business dynamism, job reallocation metrics for Netherlands, that they're also going down. So uh, we know there's something uh, that we're not doing right with, with the Netherlands. We think there's something wrong with Switzerland. We don't know what's going on with Portugal yet. Uh, but the bottom line, what I, kind of the takeaway from this is broadly across Europe, you see very sharp declines in job reallocation, these metrics of business dynamism. In, uh, this is for the last 20 years, 2000 to 2020, uh, and uh, you know, very similar declines in terms of percentages, right? Very, very sharp declines in Europe as well. We see sharp declines in startup activity. Um, this, is, this is showing you a little bit more than that because these are high growth firms, right? These are young firms that grow to be more than 20 employees, big. Um, so the young firms that are high growth, that get to be big. So this gives you the share of economic activity that is accounted by these high growth young firms. And you see dramatic declines, right, in uh, young firm, high growth young firm activity. This is a little bit problematic because high growth activity is where we think all, all of the innovation is, right? These are firms that are, are growing, and they're growing for a reason. They're growing because they're innovating in some fashion, right? That we may or may not understand. Uh, think about innovation broadly. But huge declines in terms of the share of activity that is accounted for by this young high growth. Uh, so high growth, much like in the US, is experiencing high declines very sharp declines also in Europe. Um, this is not a compositional story, right? It's not that uh, we're moving from some industries to, another, to others. Um, it's not a story uh, also about, um, you know, the, the, uh, 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 the decline in startup activity. So what this chart shows you is that within uh, the part of the decline in business dynamism that happens within industry, right? Abstracting from compositional shifts. And you see in the black line that most of the decline is a within industry phenomena, right? It's a other way of saying it's happening in all geographies. It's happening in all industries. It's also happening across all size classes. Um, Perhaps a little bit more with the larger firms. Right? We see larger declines uh, uh, with uh, in job reallocation measures, you know, within the sample of large large firms. So it's happening everywhere, uh, across all industries, all types of businesses. Um, okay. So what about the business environment in in uh, in in, uh, in the in the U.S. Sorry, in Europe. Uh, so these are uh, measures of uh, labor productivity uh, or marginal uh, rate of product of labor. We have similar pictures for, for TFP. And you can see that um, the environment is if only also getting a little bit more uh, uh, that dynamic and disruptive, right? So businesses are experiencing uh, increasing our, and live and operate in an increasingly um, turbulent environment. Okay, so if that doesn't explain the decline in, in dynamism, uh, do we see a decline in the responsiveness, right? Are businesses responding, uh, uh, experiencing or displaying a more muted response uh, to the shocks? So something like 90% of all VCs, uh, supported firms exit via mergers and acquisitions. So in, in your data, that looks like a gap. Right. Correct. 
Yeah. yeah. So uh, Leonard is asking about M and A activity and whether that's um, you know what, what's the impact of that in the in the data. And so that's exactly right, right? Increasingly, we're seeing uh, uh, high growth businesses uh, being uh, exiting through acquisition, successful acquisition, right? You see a lot more of that uh, than you see IPOs now. Um, so, it, it, right? So that 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 there's a clear trend in that regard. Here, it would show um, it would show as a um, as a death, uh, but. Uh, 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 n not really as a death. What we do here is that we shift those uh, those jobs to uh, to the business that is that is um, that is uh, acquiring them. Right? But we don't count that as uh, as natural growth. We actually discount it. Right? But your point is well taken. Some of these M&A activities, some of these businesses that are high growth, uh, end up disappearing early from the data. So we have a project actually looking at that. I'll say there's not enough of that happening to explain the patterns. Uh, but yes, uh, very, very good question. OK. So, uh, uh, so again, in the interest of time, I'm going to cut this short a little bit. So what do we do uh, in, in, in this paper? Um, so we're going to try to uh, estimate this policy function, right? Um, so here we're going to look at the firm level uh, growth response, right? Uh, um, uh, job creation, job destruction, right? The, the change in employment uh, as a rate. And it's going to be a function of the uh, innovation uh, shock to, the, to that firm, right? Whether it's a technical efficiency shock or a demand shock, it doesn't matter, right? Um, the source of the, the underlying source of the, of the, of the shock. What's the, uh, what's the intuitive idea here? This is derived from canonical models of firm dynamics, right? Firms that, um, and what do we expect to see? Firms that experience a positive shock, right? They, uh, they are better, they become better at what they do, they innovate in, in some fashion, their products are in more demand, they sell more. What do we expect them to see? We expect them to hire more uh, workers, right? To respond to that increased uh, demand. Uh, if they experience a negative shock, then we would expect them to shed workers, right? Um, to minimize their losses, right? It's that kind of standard econ one, 101, basically. Uh, this comes from first order conditions, really. So, so we're going to estimate uh, the pass through uh, uh, from the TFP shock that a firm uh, experiences, uh, the pass through to employment to their labor demand. Uh, and then we're going to see how that beta coefficient, right, that uh, uh, coefficient of, of interest, is changing over time. So is the responsiveness to a given shock uh, declining over time? That's what we're, that's what we're after. Um, and so this is from the ComNet data, uh, which is more aggregate, so it doesn't give us the, uh, fully the granularity that we want. But for the countries where we are able to estimate significant effects, that's in the solid lines, we see uh, sharp declines in responsiveness uh, uh, for, these, uh, for these economies. Right? So indeed, businesses in, this, in, in, in Europe are not as responsive as they used to be. Uh, just to give you a sense, Romania had to interpret this. Uh, firms that are one standard deviation from the industry mean, uh, they're more productive uh, than the average. In Romania, they grow 8% more. Right? So a firm that is more productive, you expect them to, to, uh, to grow. So firms in Romania that are one standard deviation above their industry mean grow on average 8% larger than the mean, right? That the average firm in that industry. Well, that response, that 8%, is now 4% for the same right, one standard deviation. Right? So a very muted response uh, in relatively few years, whatever, 20, uh, to their environment. Okay. Uh, I'm getting to the end of my, uh, of my talk. I want to show you some of the results with the, with the German microdata where we can do 
a much better job kind of use state-of-the-art uh, methodologies for estimating TFP shocks uh, to, to measure productivity. Um, and, uh, and so what do we see in Germany, right? Uh, where we can do a little bit of a better job at controlling for, for, uh, for things uh, in the data. So you still see these very sharp re declines in reallocation. Uh, this is for the manufacturing sector. Uh, so again, 25% uh, declines over, over uh, 20 years. And, uh, and so what do we see in Germany? G again, um, so focus on the uh, parameter uh, on, uh, uh, for the TFP shock, for the innovation shock. So you can see the, that beta coefficient over how that's changing over time. And in this period, it's also about half the size. So uh, again, in Germany, using these more uh, careful methods, we see in the manufacturing sector very sharp declines in terms of responsiveness. Now you might think, well, maybe this has something to do, uh, we're gonna derive a whole framework for trying to, to see whether it's uh, technology, right, the role of technology versus market power. Um, we're gonna allow for, of course, uh, 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 firms to impact prices uh, of, of products and labor. So we're gonna allow for market power and monopsony power. Uh, again, first order conditions. Um, and so uh, uh, we're gonna be able to see, again, we're gonna estimate this pass-through uh, coefficient, right? And, but now we're gonna have uh, an element that tells us uh, how the, the technology parameters or the technologies used by the firm as captured by the output elasticity of, of labor, how that might be changing uh, the responsiveness. Um, another way of saying it, firms are increasingly replacing workers with machines, well, they're not gonna be responsive in terms of hiring workers because now there's machines, right? So that's what that technology parameter is, is, is doing. Um, we also now have the, the markups and markdowns as part of the as part of the model. Um, okay, so what do we expect to see, right? If um, if output elasticity of, of labor is higher, then we would expect to see higher um, pass through uh, to labor, right? Uh, but if we see uh, a product market power right here in the uh, de uh, denominator, or uh, labor market power increasing, then that pass-through is gonna decline, right? That responsiveness is gonna decline. So what's the intuition? You have market power, you don't need to, uh, right? You, you, you're, you're a profit maximizer within, with, without adjusting your uh, demand for labor uh, as much. All right, so, um, So, so in this context, think, think about uh, the conversation about the rise of market power, uh, the rise of superstars firms, right? Um, so if, if you think uh, these larger firms are increasingly gaining market power, uh, then uh, that could explain the decline in, in, in dynamism, uh, right? So that's a, a very simple model that we, that we run. So if large firms become uh, increase their market power, or if they're increasingly replacing workers with machines, or outsourcing, then uh, their response, right, uh, their, their, their labor demand response is gonna be more, more muted over time. Okay, so the, what do we see in the data? Um, so we're gonna run again this, uh, this uh, uh, responsiveness coefficients. Now we're gonna interact with a time trend uh, but we're gonna run it separately for small, medium, and large firms. So where do we see the large declines in responsiveness? It's precisely with the medium and large firms. Right? Uh, not so much with the, with the smaller firms. Uh, we don't see a lot of activity here with young firms. Um, that might have something to do with the data set that we're working with. It's a data set in Germany that covers uh, businesses with 20 or more employees. So we're missing a little bit of the action at the bottom for the younger firms. That might explain that. That's not what we find in the US. We find a lot of declines also among young firms. 
But again, it could be something to do with the data that we're working with. And I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to end up almost here um, by saying that we see um, declines in, uh, in the average output elasticity of labor, right? So uh, these companies are indeed replacing labor with, uh, with uh, increasingly using technologies that, uh, that replace labor. Maybe they're outsourcing, maybe they're uh, automating more. Um, we also see an increase in, uh, in the average uh, market power. I'm going to say across, you know, particularly for medium and large firms. And uh, we also see increase in, in monopsony power for the larger firms. We're still in the process of uh, trying to quantify exactly what this means in terms of uh, their contribution to the decline in business dynamism. Uh, but we're not quite there uh, yet. So with that, I think I'm going to uh, give it back to um, to Rebecca, there's of course things that we still need to do, lots of things that we need to do. Uh, but just to summarize, uh, very rich data sets that we can do, uh, uh, that we can use to explore what's happening in our economies in great detail. Uh, we're finding uh, business dynamism in Europe is also declining. Uh, it's a within sector size phenomenon. There's a sharp decline in responsiveness, much like in the US. And here we're starting to dig a little bit more into what exactly is happening from this particular perspective of technology and market power. There's other explanations, right? These methods uh, uh, are not able, um, you know, we're not able to account for all potential explanations, but uh, we're making some progress uh, there. And with that, I'm going to give it back to um, to Rebecca, and um, and I'm happy to glad I'm glad to get uh, questions from the audience. Please have a seat. Well, thank you so much, Javier, for a fantastic talk. Uh, really um, interesting to hear about the process of statistical innovation and also all of the findings, and hugely impressive. Um, we, we have some time for uh, questions, um, and I think we'll take a few at a time, and then give Javier a chance to respond to, um, to them. So we'll start uh, here with Jonathan Haskell, and then uh, Martin Wheel, and then um, the gentleman here uh, to the left. D Jonathan Haskell, Imperial College and Bank of England. Thanks very much, Javier. That was really, really interesting. Uh, it, let me sound a, a couple of contrary notes just to get, get the discussion going. One contrary note might be this. Isn't this just the natural outcome of firms employing more and more skilled workers? They're doing, you know, skilled maintenance. They're doing knowledge activities, whatever it might be. And so, therefore, the costs of adjustment of those skilled workers are much higher. And rightly, firms will optimally decide not to adjust, you know, up and down as sharply as they... As as they possibly were. That, that's thought number one. And the sort of second contrary thought is, if you said to workers, your average worker, do you know what, nowadays, when my firm has a shock, I'm not going to fire you. I'm going to hold on to you. Wouldn't they say that's actually a good thing? So isn't the decline in dynamism, hasn't it got a good side to it? Yeah. Thanks very much. For sure. And uh, uh, do you want to take them one by one? I'll take it one by one because I also have a very poor memory and I will not be able to do justice to the questions. Um, very good point, Jonathan. Thank you, for, thank you for the question. Uh, and that's kind of a form of intangible, right, that we don't quite capture uh, in, in this data. And so you might expect, you might imagine that increasingly, um, you know, firm-specific capital is important and is valuable. Increasingly, workers need to train uh, more. There's all kinds of intangibles if you want to, uh, reach your target, you have to invest in right? um, ICT technologies, you have to get smarter in targeting your, uh, your audience through Facebook, <laughs> through social media. There's a lot more skills uh, required uh, to, um, you know, to, to, to operate uh, nowadays. And so potentially that could explain the lock-in into specific industries uh, or specific, uh, you know, at the firm level. Absolutely right. Um, so intangibles and, uh, and the rise of ICT could, some, could have something to do with it, for sure. Um, we see this across all industries, right? Across all geographies, across right high-tech businesses, non-high-tech businesses. 
Uh, but I, no, I have no doubt that some of that is the natural evolution of technology, right? And, and the, the natural development of modern economies are increasingly capitalized, and as such, you might expect less uh, less dynamism, right? Those those links to to take a you know to, to you need a large a bigger shock to break the to break the bonds. Um, I don't I don't doubt that there's some of that going on. There's also increasing regulation that it's impeding, potentially impeding right those types of uh, those those types of uh, linkages to break. Um, uh, you know, finance as relates to uh, intangibles is a is a is a big problem as well. So yes, the um, I think a little bit of the challenges you know that are the concerns that we bring to bear is that you also see um, a, you know a right naturally a decline in in reallocation, right? And that's going to have productivity implications if resources are locked into these businesses, whether it's because of, of training, right, or, uh, or first specific capital, or regulations, right, increasing, uh, in, or market power, right? So all of these stories are running in the background, and I, I'll say that I agree with you that we're not, right, this is, this is a very broad research agenda, and as economists, we don't have, we've not been able to quantify, right? We're in the, pro I think we're in the, I think well, as economists, we're in the business of trying to quantify these, these different types of effects, and I don't think we have good, good answers to. But there's lots of things going on. I don't know if that's a sad. It's, it's a, and I guess it's a measure of how much we don't know. Um, you know, I, I agree with you. There's lots that we don't, we don't know. Uh, it's, it's a more problem, and so, in that, and so you say, well, maybe that's good. <laughs> I'll say, maybe that's good. But we also know that startup, everything's slowing down. Startup activity is going down. We know that young, dynamic, you know, dynamism is important for our economy for other reasons, right? We know that young firms are particularly innovative, right? Large firms where a lot of these resources are locked in, rightly so. They're not, right? They're not very, they, they don't work on radical innovations, right? We know that increasingly they do. Uh, development, they do less research every day, right? And so a lot of the research is happening in, in young firms, but there's, right, there's no resources going, there's, there's, resources are not flowing for whatever reason to young, uh, to young firms. So, so some concerns there that, uh, and, and, and maybe we need to start thinking about, right, if, lo if resources are, or factors are locked in specific firms, um, well, when a shock comes, that's got important consequences, right? Yes, yeah, some firms might want to weather the storm, but a lot of firms are going to break because that's the nature of a shock, right? It's a changing environment. And if you don't have a dynamic economy that it's able to reallocate resources, again, whether it's by, because of training or because of regulation, which are also increasing dramatically, right? Then we have a problem because the economy is not going to respond. So it's a comp right. It's many it's really good questions, right? Um, and I think they hi your questions highlight how much we don't know. But it also, I, I think, in my mind, it also <coughs> highlights some of the challenges that, as policymakers, we might have uh, when our economies are, are faced with shocks. I don't know if that was a good um, answer, but thank you, thank you for that. Right. Martin Wheel, King's College London. Would you like, please, to hazard an opinion on how far you think the decline in dynamism might be a consequence of the decline in productivity growth rather than a cause of the decline in productivity growth? So uh, there are... Um, so, so I'll say... So we're, we're careful here to, I guess, two answers. Uh, I'll say we're careful here to measure the innovation shocks that firms experience, and those innovation shocks, whether they're technology, you know, technical efficiency shocks or demand shocks, that's not going down. So we're seeing, right, 
we're seeing innovation shocks happening and even increasing. Uh, what's different is that firms are not taking advantage. Uh, they don't seem to be responding at, uh, as much to take advantage of those opportunities. And that, we know, has an impact on reallocation. That's the, na that's the nature of allocative efficiency. Right? If businesses don't take advantage of those opportunities, right, if resources are not being reallocated towards businesses that are more productive and engaging in more valuable activities, then there's a loss in productivity. And, and so in the work in the US, we estimate that maybe a tenth of the decline or the slowdown in productivity growth is due to reallocation, right? The fact that things are, as Jonathan says, locked in for whatever reason in certain, in certain, com in all companies, right? Broadly across the economy is less responsive. So that's one first, kind of one part of the answer. The other part of the answer is that you're right. <laughs> kind of is like, you know, how much we don't know uh, again. So uh, there's lots of people, right? Some call them techno-pessimists, right? That say that, right, we've, we've already exploited uh, uh, and ripped the benefits of the ICT technology, the technology revolution that came with the chip, and things are just slowing down, right? There's not, not as much innovation, not as much productivity growth, and um, again, that could be explaining uh, the decline in productivity. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm gonna kind of revert, and so that, right? So reallocation, the type of thing that I'm talking about, explains about a tenth of the decline in productivity uh, growth. You know, what's happening to technology and, and technology dynamics with specific uh, technology waves, uh, I think it's also important. There's lots of people talking about that uh, as well. Uh, so maybe that's part of the, uh, maybe that's what you're referring to, for sure. So we're going to take a question up here, and then I think we'll, after that we'll, we'll have another, collect another few questions right here. Thank you. Carlo Menon from OECD. Thank you, Javier, for a very comprehensive overview of, uh, of a lot of research over many years. So um, simplifying a bit, fewer jobs are created by new entrants, fewer jobs are created by high growth young firms, and fewer jobs are created by uh, incumbents experiencing a positive productivity shock. So I'm thinking a bit the other side of a coin. So as abstracting from lower employment rate and lower activity rate, which I guess is playing only a small part of the story, where are fewer jobs being destroyed? So are uh, large incumbent firms that you show in Germany, I mean, they can be a bit cushioned by competitive pressure given uh, no, monopsony power and higher markup. Are uh, fewer low productivity small firms exiting? Or, or you know, wherever it is. And then, um, related also to, to Jonathan's comment, uh, can also be a story of higher volatility over time, longitudinal, uh, as well as, uh, you know, you show um, higher dispersion in productivity cross-sectional. So it may also be a story that companies are somehow smoothing out, the fact that is uh, over time, they experience higher, vo higher volatility over time, so they tend to adjust less to productivity shock because they know that there, there's a high volatility. And then maybe also, are we maybe looking at the wrong margin? And is, is evidence robust if you look also at reaction in turnover, allocation, or, or just or is more an employment-specific story? All right, so uh, I didn't quite catch the third one. I'll come back to that. I'll ask you again. Um, so what's happening on the downside, right? So, so you're, you're right. So the uh, you know, firms that experience a positive shock, uh, they're not responding, they're not growing as much. The same thing on the negative side. Firms that are experiencing a negative shock are not uh, um, downsizing uh, as they did in the past. So this, this, uh, this, this, happens, uh, this happening on both margins, right? The positive and the, uh, and the negative. As you might expect, right? If, if these resources are locked uh, into, into firms, uh, then uh, uh, whether it's, again, market power or, uh, uh, um, you know, intangibles, uh, the, the, they're not going to be uh, uh, as responsive going, uh, going down as well. And so we see that in the, uh, in the data. Um, 
you, you mentioned volatility, and maybe there's changing volatility in the in the in, in shocks, uh, in the shocks that firms are experiencing. The kind of the persistent, uh, maybe that's what you refer, that's how I'm interpreting your question. Right? There's the, these shocks could be reversed, uh, and that might be changing over time, right? And so. Uh, if, 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 if volatility of shocks is increasing, you might expect firms to not respond to those shocks in the expectation that they're going to be reversed. Right? Um, and so we don't see per the persistence of shocks changing very much over time. Uh, so we don't see that as a good uh, explanation for the decline in, in business dynamism that, that, we, uh, that we observe. In the, in the US, I'll say, uh, shock persistence is going down a little bit, so there's a little bit of room to explain the decline in dynamism in the US. In Europe, it turns out, persistence is going up, is what we're starting to see in the data. And so very, something very different is happening between Europe and the US in terms of shock, uh, shock persistence that we don't tr fully understand yet. Um, but the changes in shock persistence are in volatility are quite small, and so th they don't explain they can't explain what we what we what we what we see. I didn't quite catch the f the third question. Uh, well, just what's happening if you look at the turnover margin rather than employment? So is the because you know maybe also a story of you know different uh, turnover to employment ratio. So that's yeah, no, good question. So we did the same thing. So we've not done that for the uh, European data, but we did that with the U.S. data, and you see very much the same things. Uh, you might also worry that uh, what you see is right, the decline, right, the, these technology parameters are, are having a, a, a big impact. And I think that's also an important part of the story. Right? So if you're doing away with, 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 uh, with workers, right, uh, you're, you're automating, right? a lot of this, what I showed you is in the manufacturing sector. If you're automating or you, if you're outsourcing, you're not not growing in your own country, now you're growing, right? You're hiring workers abroad, um, that that's a possible, right? That's a possible margin as well. Uh, but we see the responsiveness of, of capital investments uh, mimic very much uh, the response to, um, the, the, em the employment response. So that doesn't, uh, right? You would expect, right, the responsiveness to be in opposite directions, right? If the responsiveness in terms of uh, uh, labor demand is decreasing, you would expect you know, responsiveness in, in terms of capital investments or um, physical, ca physical capital investments to increase. And we don't see that. Um, so both responsiveness in terms of employment as well as uh, investments in capital is going down. Okay, so, so, so uh, I'm aware that we're eating into the coffee break here, but um, I, I just want to give uh, an opportunity to ask one, one or two more questions, if that's okay. Is that okay? So we have a question down here, and there was a question up here as well. Uh, yeah. uh, thanks for a great talk. So Ray Lydon, Central Bank of Ireland. So two quick questions on the labour side. The secular decline in dynamism. It seems to me you tell quite a labour demand story there. But on the supply side, we've got population aging. And you could think that that's having a big, big impact. So your thoughts on that. Second question, uh, decline in reallocation after productivity shocks. Do you think job retention schemes are a bad idea? I didn't catch the last one, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask again. Uh, <coughs> yes, so there's a labor story here as well. Uh, and the answer is yes. And so our uh, populations are aging, right? Uh, we. Uh, labor supply, is in, certainly in the U.S., is in decline, and we think that has something to do, certainly, with startup activity, right? So there's people that have written models about this, uh, but that only goes right. Uh, older people are less likely to move, right? They have, they've built their their uh, human capital and firm-specific capital with the firm. They're less likely to move, uh, so that's also in the background, right? Uh, but it turns out that um, that you see huge, when you look at the worker level data, which I've not talked about at all here, but when you look at the worker level data and the, ch and the churning that's taking place, 
you see declines in worker mobility and reallocation within all kind, right, ac uh, across all age, uh, age, gr age groups, education groups, uh, right? So it's also a within, uh, how should I say it? It's, a, it's, a, it's happening across all types of workers. Uh, and uh, and so it's not just it's not just that everything's yes our economies are aging that has an impact but everything is slowing down even within uh, the sp specific uh, demographic groups so it's not a it's not that simple of a story I didn't catch the second question yes okay. uh, take a, a, a last question here and then hopefully there's still time for some coffee for everybody. <laughs> Yeah, a, a question about the, the contribution um, of market power. So I, I got that the coefficients um, are the right sign and lots of stars and your market power variables were in, in increasing, but that's statistical significance isn't the same as importance. Yeah. So what, what shared of market yeah. power? And then a second, um, uh, very different question. In your first part of your talk, you, you, you flashed up a chart of business formation, and I th the point you were making was about timeliness. But it, there didn't seem to be a sort of trend decline. In fact, a recent pickup. Doesn't that rather contradict your, your story about uh, yeah. declining dynamism? Yeah, uh, good, 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 good questions. Um, so on the, uh, on, the, on the first question, it's work in progress, so I cannot tell, right? It would not quantify the impact of those stars and those right those numbers so i can't really tell you uh, uh i i so that it's work in progress so I'll, I'll i'll let you know um on the on the second one on the on the uh on the business formation statistics um so those are absolute numbers right those are not rates uh and so the, of course they're going to be f flatter or even increasing and uh, but what's and you're right, right? It's a little bit contradictory. Certainly, what's happening in the, uh, with COVID is that we've seen a huge increase in business formations. Those business formations are not necessarily businesses with employees, uh, although it turns out that there was a, an increase in business formations from uh, also for businesses with employees. But most of those are businesses, uh, the, the the types of businesses that Leonard was talking about earlier businesses without employees and a natural response to an economy where lots of jobs are being destroyed uh, from the COVID shock, specific in, se in certain sectors, you're gonna see a lot of activity, uh, lots of individuals trying to start businesses uh, for, on their own. And so that's part of what you see. Uh, part of what you see is you know, increased opportunities um, with the internet to you know, to 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 create a business or to try to create a business uh, uh, online. So there's a little bit of that as well. Okay, I think um, we will we'll break for coffee now. Uh, thank you so much for your talk, Javier, and uh, clearly a huge research agenda ahead. Uh, lots of interest. So thanks, thanks very much. Thank you.